In a state blessed with an abundance of flowing water. Tennessee is water rich. I mean, we have aquatic biological diversity that's unrivaled anywhere on the planet. This river is a rare and precious jewel. The Conasauga is one of a handful of rivers that are biologically unique and important. Running clear and cold. The river is clean and clear. It lives up to its Cherokee namesake, which is sparkling water. Teeming with life. There are probably 90 fish species that occur in the river, at least 25 mussel species. It's one of the best places to come and catch coosa bass. Its rippling waters refresh the soul. The water has importance to people for all manner of different reasons. In the winter and spring when the flows are high because it's a beautiful setting and a good white water experience. Then you have people who, like these young men here, they've come to swim and snorkel and just enjoy being in this beautiful national forest. It's the water that attracts people. Today, what lives in that water is the attraction for these TWRA officers. We're out fish collecting. The Conasauga has a diverse fish community. You have things like the blue shiner, which is a, a small minnow uh, that turns a very pretty blue color during the spawning season. You have the Conasauga log perch. It's a small darter-like species. Redbreast, sunfish, spotted bass, another species of rock bass called shadow bass, red horses. And this is a banded sculpin, the other is a mottled sculpin. This is a highly diverse stream. There's probably over close to 40 different species of fish in this pool alone. Bug collecting. A whole universe of them down there. Looking for mussels to find out how healthy the river really is. What supports that tremendous diversity of fishes is this wonderful habitat you see here where you have shoal areas and deep pools and bedrock and cobble and that allows the benthic community, the food chain organisms, to diversify themselves also. Benthic organisms are insects living in the stream bed. The more bugs you have, especially ones that don't like pollution, the better the water quality. This is an example of marvelous water quality. But that's not the case on the lower end of the Conasauga, where that jewel of a river has been tarnished. On the lower end, it's actually listed by the state of Georgia for being impaired. You go up to the upper end and you see how great this river looks and then you come on the lower end and you think it's not the same river at all. And then you look at all the hundreds and thousands of sources of where this pollution is coming from. At one time, much of that pollution came from the nearby carpet industry. The Conestaco River for a while was noted for how the river changed colors depending on which dye they were using to dye the carpet that day. The river doesn't change colors anymore. That's been addressed through the regulatory components of the State Environmental Protection Division. Today, the primary pollutants are bacteria from failed septic systems, nutrients from agricultural and landscaping runoff, and sediment from erosion, often coming from tiny tributary streams like Swamp Creek. It's hard to believe that this peaceful stream could be a major source of pollution. But imagine this stream with water up over my head hundreds of thousands of gallons of water rushing downstream, grabbing soil, and carrying it down to the Conasauga. You know, when you see it all go away down the river, well, then, you know, I guess you realize more how important it is to try to control it some. There's probably been three or four acres of land that's washed away. It clouds up the river, but it's also coating the bottom, coating eggs that may have been laid by fish, and then, of course, it's gonna suffocate the eggs or because the river is cloudy and turbid and muddy, uh, the fish can't see their food, and so they, they'll begin to starve. Used as a pasture, the stream bank, or repairing area, was stripped of its natural vegetation and began eroding, forming a vertical bank that trapped the water during times of flooding. It was just a sheer wall of just exposed dirt. And every time the creek came up, the bank would collapse and fall in. So the first thing we had to do is slope the bank back so we can get rid of that vertical wall so that the water would come up gradually and then spill into the fields. In an effort to stabilize the bank, logs made out of coconut fibers and impregnated with native plants are placed at the base. 
Native grasses are planted and geomatting is placed along the bank to protect it until the grasses can sprout and take root. Within six months we had this kind of growth on it. Now what we're seeing about two or three years later is that if you go on the water's edge and look down you can actually see the roots dangling in into the water. Among those roots is where we see all the small fish hanging out. So we're creating a lot of aquatic habitat. The bank restoration at Swamp Creek is a small step forward in returning the Conasauga to the river it once was. While there is still much to be done, Frank believes he can see the Conasauga of the future, a river we all have the responsibility to protect. I hope that one day I'll be able to come and drive across the river on the lower end and see it kind of clear, see the rocks at the bottom. We are making improvements. I mean, when I hear Mr. Elrod talk that he sees fish coming back in here that had disappeared between the time he was a child until now. You know, it went through a period when he didn't see anything and now he's starting to see life come back. That's encouraging to me that things are changing and we're making some headway. Keeping this type of near pristine system as our population grows is just a huge challenge. And the more people who are interested in it, then the greater our chances are of protecting these kind of resources. So everyone ought to be interested in this little river. I'm Ken Tucker on Tennessee's Wild Side.